Hello and welcome to episode 5 of Jumpcast, the podcast from the award-winning team behind Jump Cut Online. My name is Sarah, I am your host for today and I am joined today by Lucy. Say hello Lucy. Hello. And Zoe. Hello. And our main review t- for today is Doctor Sleep, which is the hotly anticipated sequel to The Shining. Uh, so we've got our thoughts on that, plus we've got some news, discussion, and lots more. So let's get straight into it. So getting into the news for this week, there were a couple of uh, big, big-ish big stories that caught our attention this week. So the first of those is that uh, the Game of Thrones creators, Benioff and Weiss, I maybe ruined those names, but hopefully not, <laughs> uh, <laughs> are exiting their Star Wars trilogy So this is, yeah, this uh, had a lot of opinions on this circling around last week, but I'll just uh, read a quick, this is from the Guardian article on this. Um, So Game of Thrones creators David Benioff and D.B. Weiss have announced they are dropping out of Disney Lucasfilm's upcoming Star Wars trilogy, citing a Netflix commitment, which has left them not enough time to do both. So I'm I'm a big Game of Thrones and Star Wars fan. So at first I was kind of like, great, that you know that they're doing a Star Wars trilogy. I know in terms of their world building and their writing, particularly in the early series of Game of Thrones, they've been very strong. But the last series of Game of Thrones, which I did not care for, um, made <laughs> me <laughs> a little worried about this. And there were a lot of people as well who thought that they were perhaps shortchanging Game of Thrones because they were concentrating on Star Wars and now they're exiting Star Wars so people are like great we got a half assed series of Game of Thrones for nothing um but yeah so I, I guess the future of that trilogy is a little bit open at the moment what's going to happen but yeah this has certainly got people talking I don't know if you guys had any opinions on this at all um, I mean, as everyone knows, I'm not a Star Wars fan um, at all. Uh, I, I think I may have seen one of the films, uh, which which was fine. Yeah, it was fine. Um, just not, not my kind of genre. Uh, but I mean, I was reading that as well, that perhaps they have turned it down because they've taken on a, a Netflix um, movie or series instead. And I guess, you know, I enjoy, I quite enjoyed the last series of Game of Thrones. I joined the party quite late and I binged all seven series literally before the first one. Um, I don't personally find it to be like an amazing show anyway. Um, and I think the last season I actually maybe enjoyed it more than a lot of people that had watched it a lot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess for them they kind of need to do what they think is is the best and I mean one maybe where the money is um which I would have thought would be Lucas films because you know they're huge but perhaps Netflix is a better deal um but maybe it's you know maybe they've been offered to create something that they actually want to make over uh the Star Wars trilogy uh yeah I mean I'm I'm a bit in the same boat as Zoe really I don't really I'm not like a massive like Star Wars fan I didn't even watch Game of Thrones so I mean I'm kind of useless in this argument really but um (laughs) I guess like you know they have they have to choose one over the other and I think angry Game of Thrones fans might be happy that they're stepping away from Star Wars maybe because I know that the, the last season didn't go down very well I remember seeing a lot of like angry comments and maybe it's good that they're staying away from another franchise I don't know but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what their new Netflix thing is, mainly because I'm a big Netflix fan in general. But yeah, that's about all I've got on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that there's no... This is one of those weird stories where no one is really happy and no one is kind of really outraged. I think people are just like, okay, this is a... I mean, when I, <laughs> when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's a thing that's happening. And I... Well, we didn't really have any kind of strong opinions on it either way. So I guess we're all in the same boat in that in that sense where we're just like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> go for it. And then I guess following, uh, maybe following where the money is, it seems like the deal with Netflix is uh, going to earn them quite a nice amount of dollar. So maybe that's that's the decision at the end of the day. But yeah, so we will see, I guess, what the future of that Star Wars trilogy is, whether it still happens and someone else steps in I feel like it's late in the game now to completely drop that so I think someone else will just pick that up and um yeah uh see what their uh, Netflix big Netflix project is as well 
Um, so the next uh, big piece of news was that the sequel to uh, Into the Spider-Verse is coming in April 2022, which is so far away. I saw a lot of millennials on Twitter freaking out about how old they're going to be when it comes out. And I sat down and thought about this earlier, that in April 2022, I will be over 30 and I will also be married, which is insane. <laughs> Um, I've, what a, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where it's like I'm very excited about it because I loved the first uh, Spider-Verse film but that is so far away <laughs> I'm just like I'll be excited when I see a trailer or I see something else like story details because there was, there was a couple of teases on Twitter and the sort of like cool glitchy little video just to tease that it is a thing that's coming but my word, yeah, I guess to create a film of, of that quality, particularly with how amazing that animation style is, it is going to take a while to make that film. So interesting that they've uh, dropped the news now that it's coming when it is so far away, three, three years away. Yeah, long time to wait. But um, yeah, I, 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 I sort of know already that you guys are, you know, perhaps a bit ambivalent to this news um but yeah do you guys want to share your thoughts um spider-verse 2 are we excited are we eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've got no um i mean i'm not really a, a superhero fan i mean i heard amazing things about the first uh spider-verse thing um and i probably should watch it at some point but um when there's a lot of other movies i want to see i'm not yeah, I'm not too bothered. I'm on the net with Lucy. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's exciting news, though. I mean, I really want to see the Spider-Verse film because I saw that it absolutely blew up, obviously, on Twitter. It did really well at, like, award season and stuff. And I'm just like, I should really see it, to be honest. Um, So, no, I'm excited that it's, it's happening. And I think, it's, you know, it's they've got big shoes to fill, you know, after, after the success of the first one. But hopefully they can do it. Okay, we'll, we'll watch it. Maybe together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A little viewing party and then we'll share our thoughts again at some point when the sequel comes out maybe if we're all still you know doing jump cast in april 2022 we'll get us three back for the for that episode or something <laughs> but i mean that's that's obviously assuming that the world is still going to be here in 2022 i mean who knows will brexit have happened by then will trump have destroyed us all we'll just we'll find out i guess like exciting times exciting, <laughs> exciting and slightly terrifying times ahead as we see <laughs> if we survive long enough to see spider-verse 2 i only met two or three people like us they died when i was a kid i bumped into these things main review today is for Dr. Sleep. So years following the events of The Shining, and now adult Dan Torrance meets a young girl with similar powers as he tries to protect her from a cult known as the True Knot, who prey on children with powers in order to remain immortal. It is directed by Mike Flanagan. It is also written by Mike Flanagan, of course, based on the book by Stephen King, and it stars Ewan McGregor, Rebecca Ferguson, Zahn McLaren, Kylie Curran, Cliff Curtis, and a whole host of others. Just a very clear and loud heads up that uh, we will be spoiling the heck out of this film. There is, <laughs> it's, there's a lot to get into on this, so we really will be going all in on it and spoiling uh, lots of key plot details and other things. So if you have not seen the film, please go and see it first, and then you can obviously come back check out our review, safe in the knowledge that we are not going to ruin it for you. Or if you want it ruined for you, then, you know, go ahead, just carry on listening and we will <laughs> be happy to oblige and spoil it for you. So I am going to kick things over to Lucy first for your thoughts on Dr. Sleep. You know what? I love this. Um, and I was just saying before we recorded that I was actually expecting not to. Um, which is a bit of a stupid thing to kind of go into a cinema and think, oh, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna suck. But that's kind of what I thought, and it didn't. Um, and it was an incredible sequel. Honestly, I think you know the way it paid tribute to the original one with all of like the iconic moments and the iconic scenes and the score, obviously, was fantastic. Love that. Um, performances were amazing. I just, I was pleasantly surprised actually. 
um, because I have a bad relationship with horror sequels. I tend to not like them at all. But this was great. Honestly, I don't have a lot of criticisms at all. Good stuff. And Zoe, how about you? Are you on the same uh, the same level there as Lucy? Yes, fortunately I am. Um, I did think I was going to fall asleep, not because it's boring or because it's called Doctor Sleep, purely because the run time is um, two and a half hours, which I feel like lately every movie I've watched is getting longer and longer, which is fine, but I get very sleepy in the cinema. Um, so it, it doesn't really work out well for me. However, actually, this was the first film that I've seen in a while where it felt like it could have been even longer. I think I loved absolutely every second of it. Like Lucy said, it paid homage to the, the original Shining. It also played very closely to um, as much of the, the book as I have read, because I haven't read the full thing. I've read about half of it. Um, and I think that, you know, you can see it's been made by um, someone that has a lot of love for Kubrick's vi uh, vision of the story and then also Stephen King's vision of the story. And I think Mike Flanagan really, really kind of gives us a film that the fans want and also perhaps that people that aren't so much fans of the horror genre or even know the storyline would enjoy at the same time so yeah I think it was fantastic great I am just gonna join right in with you guys there and say that I absolutely loved it as well which it's I've seen a lot of mixed opinions on this on Twitter and was kind of gauging that people were either really really liked it or just did not like it at all and uh, like you guys was pleasantly surprised to find how much I enjoyed it and The Shining I you know is one of my favorite films of all time I think it's in my top five somewhere so I was excited about this but also a little bit apprehensive because I just didn't want something to ruin The Shining for me and that's the worst thing that this sequel could have done but I think that this as a sequel it achieves exactly what it needs to achieve in that it does not ruin the original and in fact it adds for me it added an extra layer to the original where I was like I want to go back and watch The Shining now knowing what I know from Doctor Sleep and see if that if it changes anything if it adds something else to my viewing experience of that and that's pretty incredible really for given how much I love The Shining and how much that film means to me and also just pleasantly surprised myself by the fact that I was actually able to go and see this film at the cinema I make <laughs> I definitely uh, very open about my uh I don't know how to quite how to put this but I I horror is not a genre that I enjoy and it's which is always weird because I look at my like all-time top five and I've got like Jaws and The Thing and Shining and I think Psycho is in there as well <laughs> and they're all horrors um but my main thing is seeing horrors at the cinema I am a big old wuss and I hate jump scares I hate anything that is just too intense and terrifying I am basically the opposite of Zoe and I <laughs> I was just very impressed with myself that I was able to go and see this I was like I have to it's the sequel to The Shining a film that I adore and I need to see this film so I would be lying if I said that I wasn't terrified uh, in moments of it there are certainly some look away moments I think for even some pretty hardened horror fans but yeah I, I really really liked it so yeah I, I don't know what you guys want to get into first if we want to talk about maybe the characters and the performances um Rebecca Ferguson getting a lot of a lot of attention and a lot of praise for for her role. So so yeah, let's 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 get into that. Yeah, I think uh, I think Rebecca Ferguson was was great in this. She's she's got kind of like the perfect attitude about her for the role. Um, I really really liked her. I thought she was she's very like enigmatic in the role. But uh, I also really liked seeing Ewan McGregor back because. He doesn't seem to be in as much as he used to be, which is fair enough, you know, because he's he's done a lot of great movies. But he's always been a, an actor that I've loved. You know, I loved him um, in Train Spotting, Moulin Rouge and a lot of other movies. And uh, I think he's really good in this. And I actually think as well, uh, I, I haven't got the names to hand, but the actress um, and the, the child actor that did uh, Wendy and, and Danny when they were younger it was it was great they were very uncanny to the characters which I um 
which I quite enjoyed. But I think I think the entire cast was pretty good, actually. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think um, I was surprised, you know, seeing like a younger Wendy Torrance. I was like, oh, man, that's kind of a bold decision to actually, you know, kind of bring her back and like to examine her and everything. And I was like, how are you going to like, you know, follow Shelley Duvall? But it worked. I don't know if you guys would agree with that, but I was kind of like, I thought it would be a bit too jarring, but it wasn't. Yeah, I thought I would, I thought I'd absolutely hate that, but I was pleasantly surprised. I thought, yeah, I think particularly, I'm terrible of not having the actress names here, but I thought, yeah, the the actress playing she- uh, Shelley Duvall slash Wendy Torrance was really great. And yeah, the, the kid did a great job as Danny as well. And the guy playing, oh, the, you know, the guy I mean. The guy with the shine who talks to Danny. Can't remember his name, which is terrible. Um, I know he's played by Scatman oh, um, something or other in the... Is it Dick Holleran? Yes, that's the one. Thank you. So, <laughs> saved me there as I was floundering trying to think of names. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it is quite a bold decision, like you said, to cast some people that are playing these iconic characters. I mean, they are iconic. And I think the only one that missed the mark a little for me was the guy playing Jack Torrance because it was quite a strange scene in which you were like, that is Jack Torrance, right? He's trying to be Jack Torrance. It was, they kind of tried to do like a weird slow reveal with it, didn't they? Where you weren't quite sure. I thought it was going to be a guy playing like the barman, like in The Shining, but then it ended up not. And I thought that caught me a little off guard. And also can anyone do Jack Nicholson apart from Jack Nicholson? Like it's a... Well, I had, when they were doing it, because of uh, such slow reveal, I was like, ooh, I turned to um, I turned to my boyfriend, I was like, ooh, oh my God, maybe they got actual Jack Nicholson. Then I was like, but changed his face so he's not as old anymore. And I got really, really excited. And then, I mean, the actor does look like Jack Nicholson, but... Like you said, you know, I, it threw me off a bit. I was like, oh, okay. I'll, I really wanted it to be him. Um, and yeah, I don't think anyone can can be Jack Nicholson. But I guess, I guess they did. They did try, and and that's fine. <laughs> yeah, they tried. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't sure about that. I think I was quite confused when I first saw it. I was like, is this just him thinking it's his dad? I I, I don't really know. I got confused, and maybe it wasn't the best choice there. But I think the rest of them were good. Like the rest of the original characters were were done well. I would say. Yeah, definitely. It's it's interesting what you say actually about. I just had a thought whether it would be different, better, or worse if they'd got some of the original people in and de-aged them so we know that technology exists and it's you know particularly evident in the irishman which is coming out soon so that is possible to do that but i don't know would that have been a little like a little cheesy if they'd have done that or uh, i don't know it's i kind of liked that they had people playing those roles i thought they were good and it was only really yeah the the guy playing jack that missed the mark a little bit for me mm-hmm. yeah, yeah i'd agree with that yeah, and I, I definitely want to get back into um, Rebecca Ferguson's performance because she was just, a, a, like, obviously she, I think she's in the first scene, isn't she, where she sort of meets that little girl. And from the moment you meet her, you just, I just felt uneasy. And every time she was on the screen, I was just like, you get almost like, I got almost like a chill. I was just like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't like her. But also she's incredibly charismatic and really magnetic to watch she puts in just an incredible performance where you are scared of her but also you just want to I loved it every time she was on the screen I was just like oh yes like she's such a and also I mean too late for this year's Halloween but I would like to be Rose the Hat for next Halloween please (laughs) I'm reserving that costume (laughs) so cool isn't she but you're right like I had chills like she was so good um I was kind of like she could probably like put me in a trance if she wanted to <laughs> you know what I mean like it was like yeah come with me okay you know but like you know I was kind of I was, I was really sort of like you know hypnotized by her but also terrified and that's such a hard thing to do but she was just brilliant and the aesthetic was just gorgeous like she just looked amazing I love that I love the whole thing yeah she's really really good like you guys said I mean she she really pulls you in to her character and you can see why especially if you're a child that you'd uh you'd follow her and and like you said that first scene she seems so nice and so sweet and you're like yeah you know it's like this beautiful woman because usually I guess in in a lot of horror films they depict um 
evil was you know kind of ugly it's usually it's either usually a man or if it is a female they're usually you know typically an ugly kind of horrific character that don't look like that and I think you know they're playing on um kind of a few of the the older movies with that feeling where you've got a, a beautiful woman who kind of lures lures people into her which I I really liked yeah, I, I think just a weird comparison that I didn't think I would be making is kind of got a little bit of like child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang vibes. I don't know if it was the hat. <laughs> That's awesome. But, like, the way, yeah, the way she just like lures them in and she uses uh, in the first scene, she uses the flowers, doesn't she? Or like magic tricks and is kind of, you know, the things that she knows will you know, particularly when it's a child that they will they will like or they will be attracted by. And yeah, I, I really like what you're saying as well about the, you know, that she's she is this beautiful woman and she's very kind of, she just really gives off a, you want to hear what she has to say. And I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd, I think I'd quite happily be hypnotized by her. Maybe not the gruesome death that follows, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> would let Rebecca Ferguson hypnotize me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'd, I'd quite enjoy it I don't know <laughs> but yeah the, uh, just uh, going off of that the this film really doesn't shy away from some quite horrific things and particularly the that spoiler warning again we are about to spoil something pretty major in this but the death of a small child is not it's not um yeah, it doesn't hide away from that at all, does it? It really it really shows that stuff. I was quite disturbed by that scene. I don't know what you guys thought of that. The of course talking about the um the character is played by J uh, Jacob Tremblay in a very small role but very like he's great. He's always great. So, yeah, and, uh, what did you guys think about that scene in particular? I was yeah. I was actually, you know, and you know guys, I watched like really nasty stuff. But I was actually surprised that they made it so brutal. Um, I think that was one of the, the points that I really enjoyed the film was that it was quite harsh. Um, you know, because there was the, the brutal child murder, which, yeah, it, it gets really gruesome and, and quite bloody. And it was, yeah, it took me back a little bit. Um, but then I think, you know, there's even some other deaths in there, uh, which are very harsh as well, where... I thought it would be one of those films where I watch it and I go, oh well, they what they they won't die because of course not. You know, it's not it's not it's like a more mainstream kind of horror film, but that wasn't that wasn't the truth. They went all out with it and they did kill the people that you went, oh they won't die, and you're like, oh gosh, they did actually die. And yeah, I think I was yeah I was quite disturbed by the child death actually. It upset me a bit. Mm -hmm. I was the same I, I was like on the verge of tears I think because he was so convincing like he's a fantastic actor anyway I mean you know obviously um, his, his debut in Room was just was glorious Um, and like him kind of bringing that back to this scene where he was literally like being like consumed I was like oh my god like it was it was intense no one uh, yeah uh, and it's quite I, I don't obviously you guys have got a lot more knowledge on uh, horror films than me but it's quite rare I guess to see a a child death that horrific like quite a lot of films will show you like a little bit and then it will pull away because it's like no but this really goes in and yeah I was definitely surprised by that is is that is that right that it's not it's not normally something you see in horror or not mainstream horror no um I don't know I, I haven't seen anything quite that brutal in like a mainstream horror in a long time <laughs> it tends to be more like teenagers like adults that would get that kind of treatment you know so it, it was very very uncomfortable for me yeah I mean like you said Lucy in in a lot of mainstream horror films you never they they do as much as possible to avoid something like that I mean of course in the in a lot of the horror films I like to watch um they 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 go much further than that but that they're you know they're classified into a almost a different genre where you ec you expect it to be very mean that's why I think uh, I think with this they I think they try to satisfy a lot of horror fans needs where we you know 
if you are kind of like someone like me that watches a lot of horror movies and you often watch like some of the the more disturbing horror movies when I watch a mainstream movie I often feel like I'm like it could have been a little bit harsher not too harsh but a little bit whereas this one I really liked it because they they didn't make it too you know you didn't see it too in depth but they also added it enough whereas um it would shock me perhaps more of a mainstream horror audience but also you know surprise someone like myself that watches a lot of it which I think is a really good balance to strike. I think it's it's a very bold move as well to give something or to as you say to put something like that in a mainstream horror film where it's not sanitized at all and I think there was another death that I found particularly shocking as well which I think the character's name was Billy. It was the like the friend of Danny Torrance, um, who was sort of roped into helping him sort of towards the getting towards the third act. And one of the characters, um, in her dying moments, um, sort of gets him to kill himself. And I, I gasped so loudly in the cinema. I was just like, that is horrifying. I just, it really got me. I did not. Yeah, I mean, kudos for showing it, but that was... Yeah, that was shocking. Like, the fact that in her dying breath, you don't really said kill yourself, and then, like, immediately, (sighs) yes, and you're like, oh my god, like, I I was shocked, honestly. (laughs) I know, that was really upsetting, actually. And then there was the dad. The poor dad, who did, he was just... I know, I was like, why did they have to kill the dad? No, come on. (laughs) So nice. (laughs) You didn't deserve that. No, he was so cute. Um, that was just mean. <laughs> it was yeah. very mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, lots of shock and deaths, absolutely. <laughs> and they all came quite like, they. I don't know, it didn't really spread them out that much either. It kind of felt like a lot happened, like particularly when they sort of had that showdown with the true knot. There were a lot of deaths then. And I really liked the effect of the, because obviously the, the true knot are this, cult and they feed off of the the powers of particularly young children but just anyone who kind of shows i guess it, we'll call it the shine you know the, the those kind of psychic uh, abilities or special powers and they feed off of those but when they you know they run out they store it in these like canisters don't they they call it the steam and but when they're running out of that they they can die and that death is quite quite horrific as well like they basically just sort of crumble to nothing don't they and I I in, I thought those effects were really good I thought it would look a bit I don't know it can look a bit dodgy sometimes can't they particularly when it's so reliant on CGI that kind of you know that effect but yeah I thought that was I thought that was really effective how that happened yeah I'd agree with that yeah it was the CGI actually it, it kind of was kind of seamless it didn't like stand out too much um which I was surprised at because sometimes it can go too far but it did work yeah I really liked how they um how they how they died or passed over it looked uh, it looked it was actually pretty creepy um to see them and i think i think sometimes that's where a lot of films uh falter is that you know they when people are dying or especially when it's like kind of supernatural or monstery or anything like that they overuse the cgi and they try to go like bigger than they need to and it doesn't have the same like creepy effect whereas this was really cool cuz especially when um I th- what was it like the grandpa guy was dying I mean he's no offense to him he's quite creepy looking anyway but when he was dying and he was like kind of growling and you know he was like almost turning into a monster and I thought that they kind of made it look very animalistic when they were dying which I guess in a sense like they are like a pack of animals the way that they hunt and the way that they eat so I thought that was like a really cool way to kind of show it and when and when he I, I can't remember if it was that character or another one but when he passed as well obviously he kind of then like emitted this this steam which was like you know the last of the power and you said they're like they're you know like a pack of animals and they all kind of just like lunge in don't they and yeah take what's left of the and that was quite effective as well because obviously it's this is a person this is you know one of their companions they're like, almost like a family aren't they and he's died and they kind of have that moment of like oh no we you know we don't want him to go this is sad but then like immediately it's just like i get the steam like that's the that's the thing that drives them that's what kind of keeps them going and i thought that was that was really effectively done as well and um yeah i thought that the only um effect or kind of cgi moment that 
looked a little bit like eh, it was there was a moment when Rose the Hat is kind of flying almost <laughs> and I didn't love that it was a bit I, I just it looked a bit silly I think I did yeah I, I yeah I don't know that was the only moment for me where I was like yeah and it was quite a long like uh, extended flying sequence shall we say as well where you really notice that it it, it didn't look as hot as it could have done I don't know yeah, I, th- I thought it was a bit like a bit weird. I mean, but I guess I guess the problem was was like because I was thinking about because I was like, why the hell did they do this? So weird. <laughs> She's just like flying. It reminded me of like um, I can't remember. There's some weird kids TV program that my brother watched. It remind me of that, and I was like, I don't know what's going on here. But I guess because it's all like a lot of it is is all in their minds they are trying to find the best kind of like visual representation of it because I guess otherwise like it could be a bit boring if you're just looking at like her face and she's you know trying to search for this girl um so I I I think that's why they did it whether we like it or not is a completely you know different thing because yeah it's a bit weird but I think it's just the best way they could like visually represent like mind things yeah, it's hard to get that kind of scene right as well. I don't know if you guys saw Brightburn. Yes. yes. Yeah, so that, that scene at the, again, big spoilers if you haven't seen Brightburn, uh, she, you know, he obviously he flies up with his mum into the sky. That didn't work yeah. either. I just feel for some reason, like, scenes that are, like, up in the air can often just look really shoddy. And I kind of got that vibe from it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I know, again, I agree with you. I see what they were trying to do. They were trying to make it sort of like, you know, inside the mind, like an inner world almost, but it, it just kind of missed the mark a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. It was all right. Yeah, it's, I guess it's quite, it's an, it's quite an unnatural thing to see, isn't it? So trying to get it look, I mean, people can't fly, not without the aid of like jetpacks or stuff. So yeah, <laughs> to try and make it look believable is hard and it, 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 it does have that almost like dreamlike quality to it as well doesn't it or that you know that obviously it's it's in her mind it's kind of like the visual representation of her try of searching for I think she's searching for Abra then isn't she the little girl and trying to find her so yeah I, I it's fine I can I can let it I can let it pass this time but um it just uh, yeah we've sort of have to start wrapping up in a little bit but I obviously really want to get into the how well this film kind of pays tribute to The Shining in a way that I thought was going to be really naff. I thought, like, when I saw the trailer, I was kind of like, I had that initial, oh my God, I'm excited, The Shining, like, there's the carpet, there's the twins, there's the score, and it was all the things I needed. But with you, I just had that worry, just something in the back of my mind being like, oh, this is going to be fan service and it's not going to fit in. But I thought... I thought Mike Flanagan did a fantastic job of you've got two crowds to please here. You've got the fans of The Shining, a, a you know, a beloved horror classic uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick, you know, big shoes to fill right there. And then you've got the the Stephen King fans, one of the most like passionate fan bases and Stephen King books are adapted. I mean, God, the this is our second Stephen King adaptation just on Jumpcast as we covered it chapter two on episode one. So certainly, and uh, there's been, I don't know how many levels there have been this year. Like there's so many and you have to keep all of those crowds happy. And I thought that this did a, a really good job of that. I saw one criticism on Twitter, which um, sort of said that it felt a bit disjointed and it felt like it was two films, but I completely disagree with that. I felt like, if it hadn't had those visual cues from The Shining and those things that you recognise, then it would have felt like a completely separate entity. And they were very much marketing it as, this is the sequel to The Shining, guys. Like, the poster is, you know, completely taking the, the that yellow poster, if you've seen it, the one with, with Ewan McGregor, is, is taking all those visual cues from the original, from the original poster and if it didn't have the score, if it didn't have those moments, it would just feel, you know what it is. You know this is a sequel to The Shining. The book exists. That is a sequel to The Shining, the book. So it has to acknowledge that. But I thought it was a really bold and clever move of Mike Flanagan to acknowledge both the film and the book in a way that ties it together really cohesively. And I just, I thought, I, I honestly, I was so happy with that. And there is... 
I sort of teased this on Twitter. There's a moment that I cried in, which I was not expecting to cry in. And it was just because I was so happy to sit, to just be reminded of The Shining. And it's towards the end when they're traveling to the, to the Overlook Hotel. And it just has that like fantastic, like sweeping camera movement of those trees on the island and the score. And I was just like, yes, this is amazing. I'm so happy about this. And I just shed a little happy tear because I was just excited to be watching it. Yeah, that's that bit was, I, I didn't cry, but I was clapping my hands silently, looking at my boyfriend like, ah, they're going to the fucking Overlook. I was like, oh my God, it's time. Um, and like you said, Sarah, I think, you know, they really, they had to tie the 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 two films together. I mean, you know, we're, we're following um, Danny as he's older and seeing how, you know, how messed up he got from the what happened to him as a child, which, you know, is fair enough to become an alcoholic based on that. So I think, you know, those scenes that, one, they didn't cut direct scenes from the film, they actually recreated them, which is, you know, that's going to a lot of effort. Um, whereas I think a lot of other filmmakers would just take the easy route and cut directly from the the original film. And their, their flashbacks of what happened to him, such a traumatic experience as a child, which, you know, has built his entire life, has built him who he is and ties so much into this story and why this is happening to him. And then, you know, and then they go to the Overlook and it just is such a nostalgic thing. And like you said, I think any of us that love The Shining, you get so excited that you're going back to that place where it all started and where it's going to end as well. Like, I, it just makes sense. Um, and again, you know, how he, he does deliver for both uh, Kubrick fans and both King fans. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of both. And I was just like, yes, this is it's got everything that I wanted to have it in. Uh, and I mean, I think it's just, yeah, I think he's really, really kind of understood how to bring it all together into one film and deliver a fantastic film for the audience. Yeah, I'm the same. I think I don't understand the criticisms where it's like, oh, it's disjointed or it's like two different films or whatever, because I feel like it's necessary to find the happy medium between the two. And it's so important to kind of use the original film to show Danny's trauma later in life because that would mess anybody up. And I think it's so important to visualise that and to see how it's following him around constantly. You know, it's um seeing that, uh, especially the the woman in the bath, she used to scare the hell out of me and she scared the hell out of me again. I literally remember I got home uh, and yeah. it was midnight, went to the bathroom and I was like, no, <laughs> you better not be in here. Because <laughs> I've got a shower with a curtain, right? So I was like, no. Um <laughs> But yeah, so I was scared of that. And um, I just thought it was just wonderful you've seen it again. And that end shot where she goes into the, the bathroom to get rid of the, the, the same thing Danny did. I was like, this is brilliant. It just worked. I just loved it. I think, you know, I got I got a real nostalgia hit. You know, the score was perfect. It was so much like the original. It's just, it's a love letter to The Shining. And I think, I really hope Stephen King likes this. I'm not sure if he's commented, but I really hope he does because I think it's great. If he doesn't, then he's a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did I might be I might be wrong in this and someone's probably going to correct me but I think that he does actually like it which is and he is a notoriously difficult man to please because I think he absolutely hated The Shining hated how it ended um but from what I vaguely know about how The Shining the book ends it does end with the Overlook being blown up so I don't know whether the the that ending of the of Doctor Sleep was kind of you know it's like let's pop that you know let's put that bit that bit in because it you know let's let's keep Stephen King happy he is a man who needs to be kept happy after all um so yeah I don't having little to no knowledge of the books is not helping me here I've read most of The Shining I was hoping to read that and Doctor Sleep um before but you know life gets in the way doesn't it <laughs> um but yeah I, I I really don't think it could have done a better job in terms of incorporating both of those elements and I think uh, both of you were mentioning this as well I just wanted to pick up on it really quickly is how well this film explores trauma and ex especially childhood trauma in a way that I wasn't expecting as well and I really liked that notion of again I, I don't know how much of this comes from the book but that notion of uh, Danny storing those those ghosts, those things that haunted him, those 
traumatic events and you know the horrifying old lady and the twins and <laughs> and all of those things storing them in in locked boxes and you see those frequently like those boxes are in his mind and it's you know those boxes when they sort of shows them they're also in like the overlook maze and i just really i really liked that as a visual kind of representation of you know compartmentalizing those traumatic events or those the traumatic memories and just putting them so they're still there they still exist and they have very much shaped who he is now and the kind of person that he is but they are they are locked down and obviously that I really again liked that scene of uh Danny kind of going into the the bathroom and the old woman is there and and Abra doing the same at the end as well just being like no I am gonna go and confront this horror and I am gonna lock it down and I loved that it's just it, yeah it really well like it, it explored that idea of trauma I thought in a really interesting way with those kind of visual metaphors and just in how it was conveyed in the film as well with showing how those traumatic events of The Shining of the past how they had affected Danny and I, I think it was uh, Zoe you said yeah like he's become an alcoholic like that's those events are enough to drive anyone to drink I think like it's it's totally understandable and believable that Danny Torrance would be the Danny Torrance that we see in this film after everything that's happened to him I mean in in the books in uh Doctor Sleep and what I read the 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 boxes are real um it is a trick given to him by Dick Holleran to you know make sure that he can lock away all those traumas and like you were saying you know I think when you think of actual traumas that we've we've all I'm sure we've all had uh you do kind of almost compartmentalize inside your brain and and even you know file them away in a box or in a library in a locked thing which I've seen a, a couple of other films um doing where they kind of have that that theme of of locking things in in uh you know boxes in places in your mind and I think you know one thing that perhaps never comes through in the original Shining film as much as it does in the book is just how traumatic an experience his relationship with his father is um for Danny because you know there's there's a big scene about him getting his arm snapped in half uh by Jack Torrance he he abuses him he is physical he is you know verbal he's very violent man he's actually not a fantastic dad at all which I think unfortunately in the original Shining perhaps doesn't come through as much so we don't see how traumatic regardless of all the ghosts and everything that his family life was and then of course they go to the Overlook and they get added you know a million bloody ghosts that are horrible and I think you know in in this one they touch upon it a little bit more how strained um his relationship with his father was and play into the fact that you know Jack Torrance was a violent alcoholic he was an awful man he did horrible things when he was drunk which then obviously we see um Danny Torrance doing some not very nice things when he's drunk as well and I think it's quite good to play on that yeah that's a really good point I think it, you know it's kind of it shows the horrors of like you know an abusive childhood and, and that kind of thing as well I think it's important to kind of show how this has massively affected Danny in, in ways that many people couldn't understand. And I, I love the visualisation of the, you know, putting things in boxes and hiding things away because at face value, you never know what, what someone's gone through. And I just thought it was just a great way to explore it. Yeah, I um, I, I loved you and McGregor and I thought it was fantastic. I, yeah, it was, it was a great performance. Really, really good. Good stuff. Okay, I think we're just about ready to wrap up our thoughts on Dr. Sleep. So I will ping back to you guys just for any final thoughts and of course your rating out of five. So Zoe, do you want to go first? Yes. Uh, so final thoughts. I'm very happy that it was good <laughs> and that I didn't fall asleep. Um, and yeah, I just think, you know, for, for mainstream horror fans, for even, you know, hardcore horror fans and for fans of The Shining, for fans of Stephen King, this um this is a film that actually ties everything together and is just a really fantastic example of how to do a horror sequel and how to um you know give uh an audience that already love a movie something that they're going to love again um so for me i'm going to give it i'm going to give it four and a half stars out of five good and lucy your 
final thoughts and star rating yeah i think overall it's a very very solid sequel it's a one that's gonna please many fans i think it's a love letter to the original while still bringing something completely new and sort of showing how the shining can continue on for, for years to come i would personally give it four um purely because i thought some bits were maybe a little maybe dragged on a little bit too much and you know some of the cgi wasn't quite there but other than that it's a solid four for me great i'm definitely yeah i'm just gonna completely echo what you guys said and say that i really liked it a lot more than i was anticipating i survived seeing it so yay for me <laughs> round of applause i will uh i don't know maybe maybe this is it maybe this is the start of sarah going to see horror films probably not but i i did very much enjoy it and i would um yeah i think also go for a very solid four out of five i again i like you said lucy i thought there's some of the cgi just let it down a little bit i i personally didn't have any issues with the pacing i know a lot of people are saying it is it is long and it is, but I never, I was never bored. I never checked my watch. Um, so I was, yeah, I would have happily, I quite happily watched another half hour of that, particularly as the end really gets into that, uh, you know, back to the shining almost, doesn't it? With them being at the overlook. So yeah, I, I, I very much enjoyed it and it would be a four out of five from me. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, Twitter reactions. We put out a very last minute call this morning because um, I forgot that we were recording this morning. We're <laughs> recording a day earlier than normal. So thank you so much, everyone who tweeted us and uh, has saved us from just ad libbing this part of the podcast completely. So uh, read out a couple of those. So uh, Ben Payton 007 said that it featured a scene that made me look away from the screen for the first time ever. Hideous. Hashtag baseball. Yeah, we got into that. <laughs> we got into that scene. I was hiding behind my scarf for that scene. So yeah, we agree with you on that one, Ben. And uh, at Neil Simmington says it's not a full blown horror, but more of a supernatural thriller. Ewan McGregor is better than I've seen him in a long while, and Rebecca Ferguson is very easy on the eye. We agree on that too. She. Uh, <laughs> the best thing is the storyline. I thought it was very clever, and I loved it. And we've got uh at underscore media 13 it says it doesn't reach the heights of the shining but performances from ewan mcgregor and rebecca ferguson make for a fantastic viewing mike flanagan shows why he's one of the finest horror directors out there today probably the best horror of the year no issues with pacing either and at carmen chloe um it's as much of a character driven study in trauma as it is a horror film and it never loses itself in shining fan service and we've got at Frida Talking Picks, who says it has enough to keep both Kubrick and King fans happy, although for the first half felt more like a companion piece than a sequel. Enjoyed it overall, and Rebecca Ferguson was fabulous. Never has a simple phrase like, well, hi there, been laden with such menace and evil. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> that is a gift that I will be using all the time from now on. More Rose the Hat in everything, please. She's great. Um... And we've got at horror in a tweet who says technically stunning with good performances and a lot of heart, but it's meandering narrative means it struggles to create much tension. So some yeah mixed views on Twitter, mostly on the positive side, which I'm surprised about. So maybe all the people who really hated it are having a, a nice uh, lie in this morning and have not, <laughs> have not seen our tweet in time to uh, respond to that. But yeah, thank you so much everyone for all of those thoughts and um yeah, so obviously based uh, on the fact that this is a sequel to The Shining, we've mentioned that just a couple of times, um, we thought for a quick discussion segment that we would talk about our favourite horror sequels. So I, I probably am not going to have as much to contribute to this, although I do have an answer, so yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, favourite horror sequel. Zoe, what's, what's yours? What's your fave? Well, I've got a few. Um, I guess my... Favourite horror sequel is one that not many people are going to know about, which is why I've, why I've got two. So the first one is um, Necromantic 2. <laughs> because... <laughs> Sounds delightful. <laughs> yeah, because um, I'm sure most people know that I love the first movie. And the second movie um, is pretty good because it's about uh, a female serial killer. Uh, and it's from the 80s, so I think it was quite like progressive in terms of of what it did because it all all focused about like female female sexuality maybe a kind of messed up sexuality but nevertheless female sexuality them being the dominant one going out and getting what they want um and it's actually the, the subtext is all about um 
the girl finally finding what gives her a, a climax, um, which is quite interesting for, you know, it's by a male director um, and it came out in the 80s. So I think it was quite, you know, ahead of the curve in terms of like sexual liberation for women, um, even if it did involve corpses. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then the second one I would probably say is Evil Dead 2. Um, I'm, I'm more than certain it's going to be a lot of people's uh, favourite sequel because uh, it's got a very different vibe to The Evil Dead and I do love The Evil Dead but The Evil Dead 2 is just, you know, ridiculous over the top slapstick comedy where we finally get to um, indulge in Ash's character who is, he makes the franchise and the trilogy um, in the end of everything, you know, and they obviously went on to do Ash versus Evil Dead TV series and it is about Ash and how much of an arsehole he is um, and a bit of a douchebag, but we all kind of love him for that and I think, you know, the sequel is where we've seen them go through this horrific thing in the first movie and then the second one we really get to see him bring his own um and it's yeah it's hilarious and i think most people prefer the second to the first um just because it's got a super different vibe about it but yeah probably necromantic 2 and evil dead 2. love the contrast of those two picks as well <laughs> I love it. It's true to form and then, you know, keeping the people happy. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucy, what about you? Your favourite horror sequel? Okay, people might disagree with this, but I've actually like defended this to the death before, but Saw 2 is my pick. Um, purely because if you like the original Saw, it really kind of like elevates the original concept and why, you know, John Kramer slash Jigsaw is doing what he's doing. I love a good psychopath, as everyone knows. So I like to know about <laughs> motives. I like to know about what drives a person. And mainly with Saw 2, interestingly, it's not just the traps that got me. It was the fact that it was John Kramer talking in length about, you know, what he was doing, what he expected, you know, to happen, talking to Detective Matthews. It was very much a good conversation, much like the conversation between Clarice and Hannibal, which I stand very hard. Um, so it's just, it's just nice to see psychopaths speaking about why they're doing things in a horror film and I love a bit of context so that's why I like that <laughs> I could not comment on any of the Saw films because I've not seen them so <laughs> he looks a little bit too much like a clown and we all know that's absolutely not my vibe at all so <laughs> 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 I am a wuss <laughs> um, so I searched uh, far and wide through all the many, many horror films that I enjoy on a daily basis. And I have also, Zoe, I'm with you, not on uh, Necromantic 2, but I am with you on Evil Dead 2 as my favourite horror sequel. I saw, I can't remember when I first saw Evil Dead. I think I watched it in when I was like media studies a level or something and I was like this looks wild I want to watch this so I watched the first Evil Dead and liked it for that kind of campy b-movie horror vibe and then was told that the sequel was entirely different and I was like cool okay well you know I liked the first one so let's just see how the second one goes and I loved the second Evil Dead film so much it's it's the perfect kind of horror for me where it's not too horrific because I am a big baby and I don't like anything too scary and The Evil Dead 2 certainly leans more into that comedy and I really like that and I love that it just you could almost look at Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2 and were it not for the same character just completely different films there they could not be more different I guess in certain aspects and Evil Dead 2 certainly leans more into that craziness and yeah the, I've not actually seen the third one I know about the chainsaw arm and I know that it goes to like wild wild places so I'm keen to see that at some point but yeah for now my favorite horror sequel is Evil Dead 2 so yeah I completely agree with you on that one Zoe um and yeah it's I, I haven't <laughs> seen any of the Evil Dead which is terrible that's like my like you know controversial thing of the day i haven't seen either of them so Shame i'd like you, to Lucy. i know i know how, <laughs> like honestly it's been on my list for like a hundred years and i haven't seen it and like i feel like after you two agree and i must see it right now so you've got so much joy coming your way like just just like marathon like all three of them like back to back and just have like the best time it's definitely like 
a glass it's like a, a glass of wine and a beer and a pizza movie like it's definitely that kind of particularly the, the second one like <laughs> oh so i'm so i'm just i'm excited that you have got that joy to come that's very exciting <laughs> Great. So yeah, we're almost done now. Um, so just a quick plug for next week's uh, episode of Jumpcast, which will be, I believe, hosted by Nick and he'll be joined by Corey and Chris. So controversial opinions I'm expecting on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't know what they're going to be reviewing yet. So we're just, you know, juicing you up and, and just leaving you hanging there to try and yeah make you tune in to the next, next episode after us. And uh find out what they're reviewing it they think it might be Le Mans 66 but we shall see if there's loads of films coming out that week so uh, they will decide near the time I'm sure and a very very quick plug for a couple of things on Jump Cut Online so I just wanted to highlight we've got a interview which uh, Fiona did with the Joker cinematographer Lawrence Sher, which is huge uh, if you uh, varying opinions on that film but I think most people will agree that it looks beautiful so you can read her chat with the Joker cinematographer over on Jump Cut Online. And also just a very, very quick plug for our Patreon. This is exciting. It's brand new. Uh, I think it only went up uh, yesterday or by the time you're listening to this episode, it'll be like two weeks ago. So hopefully uh, speaking to you in the future, you will have all uh, subscribed and started giving us some money, which would be great. <laughs> we need to earn some coin. And um, yeah, no, in, in all seriousness, um, this has been something that's been on the cards for a little while for Jump Cut. And uh, yeah, there are several, um, I think three different levels that you can support at. Go and check out the website uh, for all of that information. There are some truly great uh very on brand ryan gosling puns for the different subscriber <laughs> levels so i uh i don't doubt who was behind that i think that is definitely a jacob and tom uh <laughs> they've, they've had their hand in that one but great and there are so many great perks just as an example if you give at the top level which i believe is ten dollars or maybe ten pounds a month one of those um you get a uh, weekly shout outs you get discounts on jump cut merchandise you get a little spot on the website you will get exclusive first access to special one-off podcast episodes uh discounts at our affiliates you will get a jump cut gift package automatic entry to future competitions shout outs on jump cast episodes you get to vote in our awards like it, you know that is a small price to pay for all of those perks so you can go and check that out on Jump Cut Online and um, find out all the information there. We would be really, really appreciative of anyone who signs up to give. Um, yeah, we do this for the love of it. We are more than happy to, you know, do it for free. But just as we're expanding and covering more and more festivals and all of that sort of thing, it would be great to have a little bit of income as well. So thank you so much, anyone who has already given and uh, to everyone else, go and check that out on the website. So I think that's that's all the things I have to plug. I uh, just wanted to thank Lucy and Zoe for being amazing, amazing guests. And um, yeah, uh, Lucy, first, do you have any final, final comments, anything to plug? And of course, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, I think I've said everything I need to say, but if you want to follow me, it's um, at LGTH blog across pretty much all platforms. That's where you can find me. Good stuff. And Zoe, any final comments, plugs, Twitter handles? all of those things um as for plugs i've got a a new episode of um mine and my friend john's uh podcast called a nice chianti uh coming out soon where we discuss a rom-com uh the holiday so that's really weird for me because it's not a horror film um <laughs> other than that uh you can follow me on twitter or any other social media uh zobo with a shotgun Good stuff. And you can find me at Sarah Buttery. And of course, you can find all of us um, at jumpcast underscore. You can check out all of our written reviews, features, interviews, news, Patreon page, all of those things um, at jumpcutonline.co.uk. And you can go straight to jumpcutonline.co.uk forward slash jumpcast to find out where you can find all of our podcast episodes so far. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks' time. See ya.
ています。